guests this morning. Uh, they are here on an IAA fellowship and they are our artists in residence for the week. This is the New Zealand String Quartet and they have been together for over 30 years with different members but they're in uh, over their 30th year season and they've recorded music from Beethoven to Bartok. They, with an album they released in 2011 featuring New Zealand composers, they won the um, what is it? The Classical Record of the Year at the New Zealand Music Awards. Um, they perform all around the world in the prestigious concert halls and collaborating with musicians from all over the globe as well. Um, they are committed, as you can see from their presence here, to the development of young musicians and composers. And they have um, different festivals and schools that they run during the summertime. And today they're going to talk about building a chamber music career. So let's welcome our guests, the New Zealand <laughs> So first of all, we'd like to know just a little bit about you guys. Who here is a string player? Okay, quite a few. Pianist? None. Wind player? Singer? Okay, so that's basically, and, and, and who of you is actually specifically interested in chamber music as a potential career? Okay, so just under half, okay, and so we're gonna speak from our perspective, of course, so, so there might be things that you will find interesting even if chamber music is not your focus, chosen career, but there may be things that don't apply to you, so I apologize in advance. So my name's Helena, and um, I, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna start things off here by talking about how do you choose where to live, and, and how do those kind of choices come about? Um, you know, many of us finished school and thought, oh, time to go to London, time to go to New York and, and seek my fortune in the big city. Well, th that's one way of doing it, but what's ended up happening for us and what may well end up happening for many of you is that you choose a place to live that's not the big center, that is a place where there is possibly more that you can contribute rather than you needing to try and elbow your way in to find a spot. So that's sort of there's sort of two different ways of looking at it, right? You go to New York, you just got to get in the freelance scene or get, to get work and stuff. Or you go to the small place where you create the activities yourself. So that's something that you can either choose to do by thinking, this is a nice place to live and I think I can see that my, what I have to offer is necessary here. Or it might happen more through accident that you fall in love with someone, you go where they are, you um, have family somewhere, and, and either way can be the way you find a place where you can feel that you can really make a difference. So in terms of our lives, we live in New Zealand, which is a, t a country that only has under five million people, and so that, and it's also very far away from a lot of things. So there, there's, a, in a lot of ways, there's space to make a difference. There's a lot of smaller towns we can play concerts in. There are a lot of people who are looking for inspiration in, in terms of teaching. And so um, each of us individually and we as a group really feel we can make a difference in the culture there. So that um, has, has, has really defined a, how we have made our careers. Um, the place that we are in. We are the only full-time string quartet in the country, and, um, and as, as we go through describing what we do in our lives, you'll see how that really affects a lot of what, um, what we can do. So, um, one of the other things that's globally true in lots of careers is that it's much rarer to have one job for your entire life. You may have a portfolio of activities that go through your whole life in law, in, and you may find that different aspects take on a larger proportion of certain parts of your life. Um, so as a, as a string player in, um, in a town somewhere, I may do more performing for some of the time, I may be do more teaching, I may um, um, end up creating activities um, as I get inspired to do that. And that can be a wonderfully flexible way to make a living. It's not going to be the big money thing, generally. But w we believe that um, satisfaction in giving something to the world can make up for a lot of uh, 
finances, although you need to have a minimum, of course. Um, okay, so um, I'll let Monique carry on. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, so, hi, I guess my name's Monique, uh, second violinist in the quartet, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how your collaborations, actually the very stuff you're probably engaging in right now, uh, really are the key in essence for your future. Um, perhaps talking about a few personal anecdotes and also uh, how they've been beneficial, of course, in uh, being in the quartet. Um, firstly, the diversity of projects that you choose to engage in now are really essential for not only your career in terms of uh, finding more connections outside of the domain of whatever musical area you are majoring in, but also they um, help you musically in many ways. Um, for example, uh, I think between all of us, we've kind of engaged in areas including working with poets, with dancers, jazz musicians, uh, different departments musically. We've engaged in uh, improv, um, working very closely with composers and really cherishing those connections. And uh, yeah, even dabbled in Baroque music, as many fields as possible, and of course contemporary music is really essential, uh, of course, just outside of collaborating with composers. Um, a few personal anecdotes uh, from, uh, because I joined the quartet about three and a half years ago now, so a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about is very much what I found really helpful to blending immediately into this wonderful group. Um, that included actually just not following the rules, for example, um, doing as many festivals as possible while you're studying, uh, which sounds very cliche, but actually it was very useful. But I don't mean in the sense of just go for a violin festival or a flute festival. Um, go for something that somebody you've really admired and relentlessly pursuing it, for example. Um, I had an obsession with Stephen Isilis on cello um, and decided, screw it, I'm going to go for his masterclasses on, well, as a violinist. And I thought it wouldn't work out. I thought there's no chance. Um, but actually, surprisingly, uh, I was accepted to do Prussia Cove, which I highly recommend to any chamber musicians. Um, and it was incredible. And well, Prussia Cove in the UK in Cornwall, um, yeah, which is run by Stephen Islis, he's the artistic director. And um, that was incredible to be in the world of a different instrumental category and also to get the information of someone who was passionate about Schumann, who was the exact composer that I was uh, trying to really pry into at that time. And of course you make friends and lifelong connections uh, that last for decades and hopefully longer. Um, another element was uh, going for Baroque festivals. Um, that one that comes to mind was in uh, with the Orchestra de Champs-Élysées in France and they did a really intensive course where you were you know, using all the gut strings and sorry this is such a stringy perspective by the way for those non-string players but it's still relevant. Um, and yeah, really using as many bows as possible and, and really engaging with why the sound is different when you're employing different tools from different eras. And actually, a lot of that was essential in developing the palette. The more paint brushes that you add to your kind of, um, give me a word here, oh, gosh. Box of brushes, there we go. Um, they actually um, help you in your major as much as anything. And, and you, you find that you know suddenly you're playing Bartok and you have like 20 different colors from playing Baroque music. And, and then because you do maybe a contemporary focused work collaborating with a composer, you found out that, oh, now I really know how to do flal tango and I sound literally like a flute on violin. Uh, because you really explore this other domain on the instrument. Anyway, the point is, not only are all of these kind of engaging in festivals essential for your networking and finding 
um, connections that will be lifelong. Um, but they really genuinely help you artistically as well. So it's nice not to feel like it's such a utilitarian pursuit. Um, there's uh, also the issue of surviving and doing gigs to get food on the table. And um, sometimes those can be a little, uh, I don't know, doing Packabell's Cannon for the 300th time at a wedding can feel a little bit boring. So there are ways to make it interesting. Um, one thing was when I was living in Australia, uh, I had a quartet earlier on, in fact had been doing quartet since the age of 16, and I was managing this group and trying to find the, the sources of funding to get us uh, well, food on the table while studying. And we worked together very well and had a wonderful uh, vibe, we were all friends, it all, it all helps. Um, but also there was a chance to start uh, arranging pieces and learning probably about voice leading and, and many other elements musically that were beneficial later on. And um, just to make it more interesting for yourself, you can find ways to use these kind of maybe not so fun gigs in a way that's more, I don't know, moving or exciting for yourself. For example, there was one notable gig where there was no violist. That sounds like a cliche situation, but there was no violist available, and uh, I had not played viola before, but decided as a bit of a yes person, all right, screw it, I'll do it. I don't have a viola. If you can find me one, get it to me, and uh, we'll give that a go. Um, of course, it sounded like a violinist playing a viola at the beginning, um, but got the gig, and <laughs> Um, and actually that sparked a new interest, an, an interest in another instrument, which of course is related to violin, but who knows how that could work in other fields. And it actually meant that actually to this very day, joining this quartet as well, that viola has been something uh, that has emerged as a, as a performance uh, opportunity. And of course there's the added bonus of finding a deeper and richer sound and learning all the um, the gravity, the importance of gravity of the right arm and all that business. So, yeah, you can use gigs to benefit you musically while also surviving and make it intellectually stimulating for yourself so then you don't feel so depressed about not having food that week. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I hear you, you guys have really incredible programs like a great Baroque program and gamelan and doing all of those things. I have to say, at my uni at the time that I was studying at, I was doing all of that as well, like joining jazz class, joining gamelan uh, class, uh, trying my hand at composition, you know, probably really shit at some of those things, excuse my language, but, um, but it was all valuable and useful material, which takes me to finally joining the quartet and um, discovering the absolute... Um, openness and versatility in the group that not only do we now, ha uh, not now, but even before I joined, it was always a staple of the diet to play classical music as the foundation, but also an incredible uh, attention to New Zealand music and living composers today uh, was really the essence of the quartet and is the essence of the quartet's message. It's the passion that we have. And um, being able to kind of dive in to a group that's been established for, well, at, at the time, about 29 years, um, was made possible by immersing yourself in as many projects and different sound worlds as possible. Um, and Consequently, I mean, the quartet, now getting onto the quartet, they, we, I have to keep say, reminding myself, say we, have, um, we, well, actually, just a couple of years ago, we were doing a project with a Royal New Zealand Ballet, where we were required to literally gallivant across the stage, memorise the score of the music we were playing, walk across the stage with our instruments. You can imagine Rolf playing cello, you know, trying to do this. Um, and, and it was quite hilarious, but actually really a cool experience because it was so different. I mean, I'd never done that before. Um, and I don't think 
yeah, it, the point was that we were able to kind of dive into a different world that we weren't used to. The dancers needed such an intense, you know, accurate pulse. Um, and in order to carry out their choreographed moves. And also you kind of get inspired by that, by working with other people outside of your field. The way they embodied the music was something that we take with us and, and our music injects them with um, an energy as well. Um, so anyway, the point is, it's all useful. Um, did you want to say about the seven last words? No? No, okay. Um, I, I guess the final couple of points uh, that hopefully are helpful are the importance of the friends you make now um, without wanting to sound like you just use your friends um, <laughs> because it's not true. You find the deepest friendships, I feel at least, when you're studying in uni and, and you gravitate towards the people that really inspire you and make you a better human being and vice versa. And actually, later on, it's easier to look back. Um, but later on in life, they're the people that really do help you in your life as well, in your career. So the, the people you make friends with now are just the essence of your life and will eventually one day, in unexpected ways, help you. Um, so that is essential. And the last point is, anything that makes you uncomfortable is your best friend. Some, if you feel like, oh my god, I, I suck at this, like I don't want to do it, I feel really out of my zone, that's the thing you should keep trying to master until it starts to feel good. Um, because it really equates to bettering yourself intellectually and learning. And uh, the, the last thing you want to do as a musician is become complacent. Because um, ultimately that's when the music dies, and I don't think any of us want that. So, yeah, it, it keeps your passion alive. So whatever you've got going now, which feels like the vibe of this uni is great, like you guys have such a, a good, um, excited energy, just keep that forever. <laughs> anyway, I'll take you on to Jill. <laughs> okay, thanks Monique. Um, she mentioned festivals, and... Um, the, spirit, uh, the context of her mentioning was her going as a, as a student participant. And I also wanted to mention the idea of, at some stage in your life, if you find yourselves, by chance, in a, in a place where it's possible to start a festival, um, it's quite a fun thing to do. And um, I wanted to mention one that we started um, a long time ago now, in 1992, um, Monique's predecessor, second violin, who's called Doug Bielman, um, decided that it, we really needed a chain music festival in the summer in New Zealand, having not had one going. And he asked four other friends, of, of which I was one. So there was one violin, one viola, one cello, one flute, one piano. And he chose a town that's not where we lived, um, but it was a place he chose for a couple of reasons. Um, it had a very beautiful um, music hall in this school of music there, a gorgeous acoustic and, and a beautiful um, place to be in. And the city itself, small town, was a lovely one, had gorgeous weather and, and it was set in, amongst mountains and in the coast as well, and, you know, wine area. So it was a, you know, a gorgeous um, holiday place too. So, and he knew the head of the school of music there, um, who was a generous person who let us use the buildings for nothing. So we started off with this tiny little festival. The five friends just played a couple of concerts over a couple of days and local people came. I don't think we earned anything. I don't remember that side of it, but we probably had our fares paid to get there or something like that. I stayed with a friend and some of the others stayed in tents, you know, in people's gardens, that sort of thing. There was no budget, there was nothing. But um, it, we really enjoyed ourselves and it was fun and the locals said, oh, this is nice. The audience. So we decided to do it again the next year and expand a little bit by having some master classes um, on our instruments. So, you know, these p people came, students, kids, and yeah, you know, ch school age kids came, and we did a few classes, and then we did another few more concerts, and you know, people said, "Oh, that was very nice." So then we decided to keep doing it, and um, it became an every second year thing. And we've just done. Um, so it's carried on in that form. We've just done one this year and it's grown and grown very organically and naturally 
people came along and said, oh, you know, quite like to help you guys out, you know, can we kind of help in some way? And volunteers came along and, um, and then some funding came. I can't even remember how that all happened now because it's in the 90s, but there was a bit of local council funding and an arts council put some money and did a few individuals and it sort of just grew very naturally. So, but, um, so it wasn't a difficult thing to start because we just had such small ambitions at the beginning. We just wanted to play for, sort of almost for ourselves. We just wanted to have a nice time playing. And, and it's grown into a really, you know, quite a big thing now, where this year we had the Jerusalem Quartet and we had two pianists coming from Hungary and audience from around, a lot from around the country, but, you know, quite a few from overseas as well and sort of mini concerts sold out. So what started really tiny and just very sort of just for fun has grown into something really worthwhile. But even if it hadn't grown so big, it's still um, a wonderful venture because you can um, play the pieces you choose. You can, if you're running it, uh, which Helena and I now do, um, you know, you can ask the people you want and just choose the repertoire and choose the themes and, you know, and work with the local um, board of the festival and, and get to know the volunteers and create a really beautiful buzz in, in that part of the world. So it just seems a really a great thing to do because in summer, um, you know, there's not a lot of other concerts happening. The general seasons are, are, have stopped over the summer. So it's a, um, you know, a chance for people to sort of really delve into hearing a lot of music over a short period of time and having a sort of holiday at the same time. Because many people come from outside, they book accommodation and they come with their friends and they're having a, a wonderful experience overall and it creates this artistic sort of bubble. Um, because festivals have an amazing um, effect on people, we've been realising. People who wouldn't dream of going to hear such and such a piece, you know, normally, they'll just, they'll just stomach anything in a festival. You know, off they go and they'll hear, you know, something they don't maybe like that much, but there's other pieces around it and all their friends are going. And, and then they talk about it all afterwards in the cafes and they're sort of, it just creates this really lovely energy and people do realise, oh, why did I not think I'd like that? I, I do like it or I'm going to listen to more by that composer, or, or that sort of thing. It, it opens people's minds up. It's the same with movies, you know, move, in film festivals. People just sort of go to three a day here, and, you know, they end up in a week, and they've been to 20 movies, and the sort of... You would never normally do that, but people sort of are prepared to when it's a festival, so it has a, a whole sort of different life of its own. Anyway, so just to say that it's, it's not an impossible thing to do, and if you ever, you know, feel like it, give it a go just start small and see where it takes you. And uh, now the other thing I was going to talk about with you guys today is teaching in the future. Um, how many of you do teach already in Hubert at the moment? Yeah, yeah that's great, quite a lot of you. And um, do you find it, obviously it, it helps pay for food on the table, rent and all that, do you find it um, helps your own digestion of technique, technical issues in, in your own playing? You, you do. Right, I mean, I've, I've always found that same thing, that it's very enlightening for me and my playing and, and just so fascinating to, um, to see what works with a student and what doesn't and what, um, how to approach different, different things technically, musically and personally with students. So it seems like it's a really good thing to have in the portfolio um, in the future if you can um, manage it. And, um, you know, you can have as many or as few as, as your life can handle or you can handle. Um, and there's so many wonderful online um, tools available to help with teaching now. It's just endless, you know, people giving classes and, and advising you in all sorts of ways. So it's wonderful. I don't think we have to be perfect teachers. We don't have to think of, I don't know everything, I can't start. We can start and keep growing all the time as, as we go along. Um, in New Zealand, and I'm sure here too, there are these um, wonderful schemes now for people in areas with low, um, lowest socioeconomic areas where uh, lots of sc uh, school age children um, learning instruments and being given instruments um, and learning for nothing. And I don't know if you have many around here. We have what's called Sustema um, programs, which started in Venezuela and um, it started as social programs, um, taking kids who would otherwise be on the streets after school and 
maybe getting into bad habits and trouble and um, being given thrust, you know, taken somewhere and given a violin and, and taught um, together in big groups how to play the violin and realised, oh, this is really fun. And they were also fed and um, taught other things like manners and um, behavioural stuff. And it, it just transformed people's lives. So it's been, you know, it's been popular um, in other countries too. We've got several of them happening in New Zealand now and um, really, really changing people's lives and offering a lot of employment to young teachers, people who've just left studies are now um, putting that in their portfolio, two or three afternoons a week um, teaching at Sistema. And there's other programs equivalent um, around the place. We also have a summer school um, once a year for about eight days, which is a chamber music course. And so lots of students from around New Zealand, they have to be strings or piano usually, um, have come and we've, we put them into a group or they put themselves into a group. It's all organised very well in advance. And they work really hard at their one big masterpiece for the week and do a final concert at the end, which is you know, usually on a very, very good level. And we were delighted to hear that one of our, or two of our former students have started an equivalent thing in Mexico this year. Um, so that's um, felt really good to us that they, you know, this, this sort of model is um, being copied and spread elsewhere as well. So just to keep that idea in mind that you can be a full-time performer but also keep some teaching going and that's a way of connecting with your community and um, getting to know people and their, maybe their parents and um, really using your, your skills to benefit others in the community. So. Rolston, uh, just hearing all these points, um, just thought it would be good to just elaborate or put a little bit of an exclamation mark on some of the these great points, especially uh, that Monique made about career versatility. I think the overriding sort of spirit that you get from us talking is the passion for learning. I think that's number one. The passion for learning and the lack of fear to go into a zone that you're not comfortable with. And there's all this, this today's talk is about career and everything. But what drives career is essentially your love for music and your passion. And it's um, not enough just to say, oh, be passionate about what you're doing. But if you're passionate about something, you see no restrictions ahead of you. As Monique says, if something's uncomfortable, you work it out, you find a solution. And actually finding the solution for things and being able to change is the way you learn, as you all know. I had a teacher who every day it seemed he was changing my bow arm and I thought, just tell me, how do I hold the bow? And the point in the end was, you always have to find the feel for it and it always might be slightly different. And I think that's true with life. We're always changing, our body's always changing. So this openness comes with your love and passion. It's, we're not telling you, oh, you have to do these things to have a career. We're telling you, Find a mental attitude that is fulfilling and exciting for you and, and follow that and you'll start engaging people in that way. Um, and I, just one little uh, story, when I was talking to the principal clarinetist of the Berlin Phil, I was kind of in awe of his playing, Carl Lester, and I said, how did you ever get to be principal clarinetist of the Berlin Phil? And he said, you know, I never thought about any of these things. I always just uh, played to the best of my ability and I just did everything I could as, as Monique explained in her getting to the quartet. And um, I just ended up doing it because this is what I love to do. And I thought, well, that's pretty simple. But um, as Monique said, just if you can uh, preserve that love and that energy and that excitement and spontaneity, that'll be contagious. Now that goes into the, the theme. I have a little category, but it might take a lot of time because we thought the point of it all is when you sit down and play, people hear your voice. Or when you express yourself in a lesson, people feel your passion, even if you're not saying the right things. It's more the way you say things. So we'd like to play a little bit to see if you can feel the effects of the next category, which is 
uh, subcategory of this, and it's our engagement with composers. Now, in New Zealand, we have an enormous amount, an enormous amount of um, very fine composers, and um, they're well supported by um, arts council grants and universities, and so they. Um, there, many of them are very prolific, but because of our distance away from I don't know, the rest of the music world, I think um, more percentage of them seem to draw influences from just anywhere. We see ourselves as um, a little door opening to the world, but you know, not in the middle of the music world. So, uh, of course, nowadays all composers can reach out anywhere and hear anybody's composition over the net. But, um, so today I'd like to um, show you through our playing how the composer's styles have influenced compositions that we play. And um, I should say that um, we've developed our relationships because of our, our love of uh, their, their music and uh, um, our appreciation of them as as composers and, and persons. Um, and many of them have been in our institution, the University of Wellington, in, I mean, uh, Victoria University in Wellington. And we've developed very close relationships. And those relationships um, are interesting because the, when we ask the composers, well, why didn't you write this certain passage? They, they'll say, well, I had you in mind, and I had Julie in mind, in mind when I wrote this, and, and uh, many of them were inspired by the fact that they could actually imagine us on stage performing these works and help them write their work. So don't underestimate the value you have to a composer. But on the other side, the composers have opened our minds, as Monique was saying, to um, the compositional process, which is so important for interpretation. We have to be able to be composers when we perform, and perform as if the composition was ours, right? But being with composers and the way they create really helps us do that. It also helps us articulate ideas in music, because composers have to articulate so often what they're trying to achieve in order to get people to listen to their music or help them understand it. And um, we've learned a lot over the years by um, the way composers articulate. So um, maybe we'll spend the next five minutes and I'll play you three or four different excerpts. And here the first one is by a composer named Ross Harris, who was incredibly studied. He taught counterpoint. He was interested in the second Viennese school. And his writing is quite complex, but he's very sophisticated, and he heard us do variation 25 when we played the Goldberg variations, string quartet, not harpsichord, and he was so inspired that he went home and he wrote his version, his reaction to variation 25. Now we won't play you the Bach version, but the first few notes, play the, just the first uh, motive. That's how the Bach starts. And Ross Harris was so stunned by Bach's chromaticism and dissonance that he intensified it by putting imitation very close together and then started to manipulate and disintegrate the, the, or distill the style, almost like Webern, and fragment it to give an expression of what he feels is happening in life and in the world now. So, this is um, a few bars of this composition.
and paste. But uh, so this is the way his his language sounds, and he's written about six symphonies and many beautiful works. So this kind of style. Now another composer, Jack Body, came from um, an academic background, but then veered off into the folk music world and went all over the world collecting original tapes of folk music. Um, a lot of the time in China, Indonesia, uh, very interested in gamelan and... Sorry to interrupt. Who was here last night? So some of you heard us play that Jack Body piece? Yeah, so that's that same composer. Yeah, so um, he also got to know us very well and he would jump in the room excited about a project and here's an example of how the career takes takes off. Um, we heard this unbelievable Chinese orchestra. Has anybody ever heard of the Forbidden City Chamber Orchestra? It's a Chinese orchestra in Beijing. Well, they performed in Wellington, and it was one of the most virtuosic chamber ensembles we've ever heard in our lives. And, and um, we told Jack at the concert, how can, how can we play with them? How can we have more, more engagement with these people? And he came in the next day with the director and said, okay, we're going to create a project with this orchestra and string quartet. And we thought, yeah, yeah, right. And he came up with a project where he got seven composers to write pieces, especially for, cha for uh, Western string quartet and Chinese orchestra. And it was um, so successful, we made a recording in Beijing, we played in the Forbidden City Hall, we did a tour of New Zealand with this great orchestra. So just from our going to a concert, getting excited, talking to the composer, and... And then uh, waiting a couple of years. Yeah, right? yeah, of course. And then just, just things took off. So this is um, an arranged, this is um, the first one. Yeah, this is... Um, inspired by a kind of Chinese Jews harp where one person plays this this harp and Jack has arranged it for a whole string quartet just fulfilling what the one person is doing. Which is, is like a, a horn. And um, 
got to know the sound of this instrument and loved it, and she created this piece uh, imitating that instrument. And it, um, it, came, it came out of something so unique that um, we feel it's a great gift to us. Most of the notes are in quarter tones, and so because the instrument itself uh, wasn't, you know, on the piano pitches on a chromatic scale, so you'll hear some very strange intonation. So but I begin with the horn, and then there's other instruments that are introduced. In fact, it's all, it's three different ways of playing this one um, wooden, wooden, wooden flute, really. It's like a thick flute. You can play it like a horn at one end with a brass player um, sound, like, um, that's how we begin. Yeah, I, I, I should, and then, should and then, and then there's a, a sound where you blow, I, I know, I know. Oh, okay. where you blow across the middle of the, a, a hole in the middle, which sounds very, very sort of hollow. And it's so, so no. Yo, just play a few bars, sorry, very, okay. very short, so okay. short. All right. <laughs> so here's the call of the, you know. So, you know, we're, 
we're all standing here talking to you. That's another thing that we have found to be really important in our lives, is that not only to do our art well, but to e express it so that people have a way in. Those of you who were at the concert last night noticed that we talked about most of the pieces, that our, our in intent is to engage people who don't know much about it, to, so that they might enjoy it a little bit more. When we do intermedia interviews, we always are trying to think, what's our key message here? And then when they ask a dumb question, you, 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 you make your way back to your key message. And the key message is not just about the tour you're about to do, the concert you're about to do, but what is it that we actually think music is all about? And um, so, in, 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 so learn to speak about your art, learn to write. You may be bored with writing essays here, but it's actually, looking back, my English class at Eastman was really important. I learned, I, you know, I, I read literature, I had to write about it, I had to express myself, I had to use good grammar, I had to be a compelling writer. That, so that was really, really an important skill I learned. So my, let us encourage you to not find that boring, but find it important. Um, uh, um, we have so, to wrap it up because it's oh, yeah? a little okay. bit. Okay, well that's, that's fine. That's, a, that's an okay, way, okay place to end. And I mean, something that we haven't gotten into at all is, is all the new media. So we know it's out there. You know more than we do. Use it. Thank you. <laughs>